friends, we are very happy to see each of you here this Sabbath morning. I want to welcome our friends who are worshiping with us around the world. Some of you are keeping your first Sabbath day, and we hope that you are able to capitalize on the blessing that God has promised to pour into this 24-hour dimension of time. And I pray that each of us will join in uh, praying for these people who are tasting their first Sabbath today, that God will bless them and they'll find out that the Lord is good. Amen? Amen. Some folks are making decisions about baptism this coming Sabbath. You know, we're going to have a baptism here in Manhattan, our Manhattan Center in New York City. I know some of the locations around the country are going to have uh, baptisms. Let me give you a little extra something to pray about. When a person makes a decision to commit their life to Jesus, everything gets easier, right? No. Not necessarily. When the children of Israel began to be born as a nation and make their exodus from Egypt, the Pharaoh intensified his pressure and tightened his grip. After Christ was baptized, temptation came in the wilderness. You see, when you are contemplating baptism, you are talking about joining the winning team, and you become a threat to the enemy. And so we want to pray that God will set a hedge of angels about those of you who are thinking of making this decision and warn you in advance that you may encounter some resistance. Matter of fact, you could probably plan on it. Uh, the Bible says all that live godly will suffer persecution. Amen? So we want to pray for those of you who are talking about and praying about making this decision to follow the Lord out of Egypt and begin your journey to the promised land. Amen? Amen. Well, we are going to continue with our lesson as we've been doing. And we are going through our study today dealing with windows of heaven. Windows of heaven. Have you been filling out your lessons? Good. I'm going to need you to help me call out the answers. Because when I ran out of my apartment today, I grabbed the blank lesson instead of the one I normally have with my answers in it. Our amazing fact now is dealing with the substance of gold. You know, it's one of the most incredible things. You find gold mentioned 450 times in the Bible. Our Lord tells us the redeemed will walk on streets of gold. You may not know it, but gold is one of the most malleable substances in the world, if not the most. You can take one ounce of gold, and it can be drawn into a thread, one ounce, 50 miles long. I understand that one ounce of gold can be hammered within 100 thousandth of an inch, which means that an ounce of gold can cover a tennis court when you pound it out fine enough. Most of the gold of the world is still undiscovered. There are approximately 9 billion tons of gold in the ocean. The problem is that seawater, which has like, um, oh, for every 100 million gallons of seawater, there are 250 parts of gold. It costs so much to get the gold out of the seawater that nobody's doing it. You know that uh, all of the gold in the United States in, in 1848 did not come anywhere near what they discovered five years after the gold rush that began in 1848. In those five years, they were able to acquire 21 times the total amount that was owned by the United States up to that point. The gold rush. And we live there in Sacramento where they... Uh, so the gold rush was spawned and we have some friends that are still prospecting for gold. Tragedy is that some people here in this world are willing to sacrifice their souls for a little bit of this earthly gold when it's going to be the asphalt in the kingdom. Amen? The streets are going to be paved with gold. Let's go to our historical now that deals with this subject of windows of heaven. In our story, we know that originally Isaac and Rebekah had two sons. What were their names? Jacob and Esau. Though they were twins, they were vastly different. Something like Cain and Abel. Jacob was a shepherd, and he was a very strong man, but he was a gentle man as well. And Esau, he liked to hunt and roam the fields. He was sort of a wild man. He evidently had an um, interesting characteristic. He was as hairy as a gorilla. I don't know any other way to say it except to tell you that uh, when someone wanted to impersonate Esau, they had to put on lamb skin or goat skin. So the fellow was very virile in that way. Esau, because he was born a few minutes before Jacob, he technically had the birthright. Now, the birthright involved a couple of things. 
First of all, the firstborn son received a double portion of the father's inheritance. But for Jacob, the birthright really had the greatest blessing in that the Messiah was going to come through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wanted that promise that the whole world would be blessed through his descendants. The spiritual blessing of the birthright is what Jacob really coveted. One day after Esau had been out hunting, he came back, hadn't been able to capture any game, and uh, he was famished, faint with hunger and exhausted. And he noticed that here Jacob was in the mouth of his tent cooking up a pot of red beans. He said, please, give me some beans. Jacob said, well, strike a deal. I said, tell you what, you let me have the inheritance of the firstborn, sell me your inheritance, and I'll feed you. Well, Esau thought that was a low blow, but he thought, what's the, what's the use? He said, uh, I'm starving right now, and he sold his spiritual inheritance for a pot of beans. And we understand they were red beans because the word Esau, Edom, means red, and he became the father of the Edomites. Well, Jacob wasn't satisfied with Esau's word. And when Isaac was getting old and he was blind and he was ready to bless his sons, give them the paternal spiritual blessing, he told Esau, go out hunting, capture the game that you know I love, bring, bring it back, I'll eat, and when my heart is merry, I'll give you the patriarchal paternal blessing, the spiritual blessing. Well, Rebecca was listening. Rebecca really loved Jacob more than Esau, and she wanted him to get that blessing. God had promised when he was born that the youngest would get the, the special spiritual blessing, but she wanted to help God out. You know, just like Abraham wanted to help God out when he took Hagar so that he could have a son. And so she waited until Esau was gone, and she told Jacob, I've got a plan. Impersonate your brother. He said, my father's going to find out that I'm a deceiver, and I'll receive a curse instead of a blessing. She said, let your curse be upon me. You trust me. Don't argue with me. I'm your mother. And he wanted the blessing, so he cooperated. And she put on Esau's clothes, and Esau smelled like the field and campfires. And, and she put the skin of a goat on the back of his neck and on his wrist. So Esau was so hairy. You know, there are some people that have this rare defect where there are, every part of their body is covered with hair. You've heard about these people? They wonder if Esau was one of these people. They just the hair all over the face, everywhere but the eyes. And... and uh, and so he dressed up with this fur, and he went in, and Isaac said, who is that? And he said, it's Esau, your firstborn. Said, Esau, how do you find the game so quickly? Oh, the Lord brought it to me. Come, let me feel you and smell you. He said, you smell like Esau. You feel like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. <laughs> oh, no, it's me, Esau. And so he managed to secure the patriarchal blessing, the spiritual blessing that he wanted. And no sooner had he gone out of his father's presence than Esau came along. He said, Dad, I've got some venison. Here, eat and bless me. He said, who are you? He said, I'm Esau. I said, no, no, I just blessed Esau. And he found out he had been deceived. The word Jacob means deceiver. Well, Esau, when he found out that his brother had managed to take the blessing of the firstborn, he was so enraged that he was beginning to plot murderous designs. When Jacob got wind of that, under pretense of going out of town to look for a wife, he had to basically flee empty-handed. The Bible says he ran from home with nothing but a staff in his hand. And he was feeling really forsaken by God. He knew he shouldn't have deceived his father. He was so sorry for what he had done. He repented. He asked God to forgive him. Cried himself to sleep with nothing but a rock for a pillow left home empty-handed. Don't miss that. That night, while he was sleeping there with a stone for a pillow, rock represents Christ, he had a dream of this heavenly escalator that was reaching up into the heavens and angels of God were ascending and descending on this ladder. And then God spoke to him and said, I am the Lord. I am with you wherever you go. I will bless you. And Jacob was so thankful for the promise that he was forgiven. He said, if you will indeed bless me, I'm going to make a covenant with you. If you'll prosper me in the way in which I go and bring me safely back to my father's land. He said, all that you shall give me, I will surely give the tenth to thee. Now that leads into the subject of our lesson. Returning our blessings to God. And God promises to open the windows of heaven. Question number one in our study. Where did Jacob learn this principle, this concept of returning a tenth 
to God. Say the answer with me. And Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God, and he, Abraham, gave him tithes of all. Now, what does the word tithe mean? The word tithe means tenth. That's all that means. Abraham, the grandfather of Jacob, was in the practice of giving tithes to the high priest. Who was this high priest, Melchizedek, that we hear about? You know, the Bible tells us that this priest, Melchizedek, was the king of Salem. And this king of Salem was the king of what later would be called Jeru Shalom, Jeru Salem. Melchizedek, the high priest, the king, was a type of Jesus, who is our king and our high priest in the new Jeru Shalom, see? And Abraham giving tithes to Melchizedek is a symbol of us, God's people, returning a percentage of our increase to God. Now, you might be thinking, Doug, why in a prophecy seminar are you talking about giving? I knew it was coming, you know. Whenever you get pastors a few spare minutes, they start talking about giving money. Friends, please remember this. In the judgment day, you will give an account to God for two principal things. What you have done with who you are and what you have done with what you have. You are to be a steward of your time and your means. We have substance that we have an element of control over and we are responsible for what we do with the things and, and the individuals that God has committed to our care. And we are responsible for what we do with our time, our lives. And so the Bible has an enormous amount to say about substance and the proper management and stewardship of our resources. We are living now in a society, in a culture that really misunderstands this principle. We are, at least in North America, the most materialistic people in the world. And it's not all your fault. You're constantly being bombarded with advertising that says, buy, buy, buy. The average American has four credit cards. And I forget what the percentages are, but I, I understand that the average American's their credit cards are like $10,000 in debt on their credit cards. We are so overspent because we've become so materialistic. The Bible has some principles where if we understand the biblical principles, we can ultimately be debt-free and prosper. Now, I'll define what that means as we proceed. Question number two. What portion of our income belongs to God? Say the answer with me. All the tithe is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Now, again, the tithe is the tenth. Ten percent of all of our income and our increase belongs to God. Is that right? Wrong. It's the right answer, but it's wrong. A hundred percent of all that you have belongs to God. A hundred percent of your time belongs to God. God asks us to acknowledge that we believe a hundred percent of our time belongs to Him by returning one day in seven as holy. Isn't that right? What do we call this day? The Sabbath day. All of our time belongs to God. He can take it all instantly if He chooses. Every heartbeat is a gift of God. Amen? He says, if you believe all of, my, all of your time belongs to me and your life is a gift of mine, that I am your creator, then I want you to return every seventh day that I've blessed to me to acknowledge that. That's one purpose of the Sabbath. A hundred percent of all your resources belong to God. He can give it, He can take it in one day. He says, I want you to acknowledge that you trust me and believe that and return one-tenth of your increase to me and I will bless the other ninety percent if you do that. It's an act of faith. Now, we'll go on here and I'll explain this a little better. Question number three. What does God do with our tithe? Why does God ask for our tithe? It's because He doesn't want to go on food stamps, right? The Lord, that's why He's asking for tithe, because uh, He doesn't want to be unemployed. He needs our money. No, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns everything. The cattle on a thousand hills are His. Amen? So why is God asking for the tithe? Because God has a plan He designed in the Bible for the support of spreading the good news around the world. The Bible tells us in the answer, Numbers 18, 21, and 24, I've given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance for their service which they serve. Second part of the answer. It says, The tithes of the children of Israel I have given to the Levites to inherit. The tithe was for the Levites. This is further explained in the next uh, 
passage. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. God has us, God has a plan where he's designed that the pastors are to be supported by the gifts of the tithe. It further says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 13 and 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. The Lord has this plan designed so that ministers can put all of their time and their heart into the work of preaching the gospel. Now, the church I'm part of, Seventh-day Adventist Church, this is the plan that they go along with. It's a Bible plan. I know some of my friends who are pastors of other churches where one day a week they pass to the church. The other five or six days a week they have to work to get income to pay their bills and put their kids through school and take care of the, the needs of the family. And they are so preoccupied through the week with trying to work and just manage their expenses that by the time they get up to preach Sunday morning they fall asleep during their own sermon. It's bad enough when everyone else falls asleep during my sermon. I don't, want them, I don't want to fall asleep during my sermon, right? And so God's design is that the ministry is to be at work one day a week? No. It's to be at work 24 hours a day. Pastors are on call. We are to be servants of the Lord. Pastors even serve God on the Sabbath. And I got a question in. Someone said, the Bible says you're not supposed to work, but aren't you busy working on the Sabbath? Yep. And Jesus said, my father works, and hereunto I work. And Christ said, the priests profane the Sabbath. In other words, the priests work on the Sabbath and are guiltless. And so God has designed that we do the work of the Lord on the Sabbath day. Now, you won't see me mowing my lawn, but you will see me preaching the word because it's a holy work that is appropriate on a holy day. And so God has this plan so that his ministers can be dedicating and his missionaries dedicating their full time and attention to preaching the gospel. Question number four. Is the tithing system part of Moses' old law which ended at the cross? Some people say, oh, that passed away at the cross. But does it go back before Moses? Yes, in the answer. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Whatever you give me, I will give the tenth unto thee. The tenth is the tithe. Now this existed before Moses. Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek hundreds of years before Moses. So part of God's original plan for his people, and if you are Christ, you are part of Abraham's seed, is the concept of tithes and offerings. Number five, but didn't Jesus condemn the tithing plan? I thought Christ came to do away with that. No, on the contrary, Jesus endorsed it. You can read about this in Matthew 23, 23. That's an easy verse. Woe unto you, Christ said, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Those were little herbs in their garden. And just to give you the picture, they were so careful about paying their tithe that they would count out if they had, you know, ten sprigs of parsley, they'd give one to the Lord, and they'd count out, you know, the seeds in their tomatoes, and one out of ten, that went to the Lord, and very precise and paying tithe out of their herb gardens. But Jesus said, you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. You know, God has priorities, and tithe is important, but these were the weightier matters. But Christ goes on to say, these ought you to have done and not leave the other undone. Did you get that? Don't leave the other undone. Continue to pay tithe, but do not neglect the weightier matters. Amen? So Jesus is saying tithe was part of his original plan and is still part of the plan for the church. Question number six. What amazing promise does God make about tithing? Now, Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and Prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God promises to open the windows of heaven and bless his people if they will remember to return their tithes. Now keep in mind, back in Bible times, they were an agricultural society. Opening the windows of heaven was an assurance that there would be the rain and the dew of heaven that would give them bumper crops. For us today, God still promises to open the windows of heaven if we are faithful in returning our tithes and offerings. There are different ways that he does that. 
Not only does he promise to open the windows of heaven, he promises to rebuke the devourer for your sake. You read that there in Malachi chapter 3? He opens the windows of heaven so that it will increase your harvest. And then he says, I'll rebuke the devourer. You see, back in Bible times, being farmers and agricultural, they had pests that would get into the flocks and they had worms and grasshoppers that ate the harvest and mice that got into the silos and ate the grain and, and moths that ate their clothes. And it seemed like their resources were eroded. The Lord is telling us if we are faithful in returning our tithes and offerings to God, that he will not only bless us with more, he will prolong what we have. When the Lord brought the children of Israel through the wilderness, he says because he was with them and he blessed them, their clothes did not wear out. Their shoes did not wear out. God has a, a way of making your resources last longer. I've got a friend who prayed. Some of you know Roger Morneau. And his copy machine ran out of uh, ink and the cartridge cost $70 and he didn't have the money. And he prayed and said, Lord, I don't have the money and I'm doing your work. Please bless my copy machine. And he said it went through about another five reams of paper before it went out. It lasted for several more months after that. It was just a miracle. He kept the thing going. And I've seen the Lord do that for us. When you're faithful in paying tithes, it seems like your car doesn't break down as much. And your refrigerator lasts a little longer. And God rebukes the devourer for your sakes. I've got news for you, friends. 90% that is blessed goes a whole lot farther than 100% that is cursed. And a lot of people are in constant extremity financially because they've been unfaithful in returning their tithes and offerings to God. He wants to open the windows of heaven and bless them. Number seven. God tells his people to bring all the tithes into the storehouse. What does that mean? Answer, it says, Then brought all Judea the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil into the treasuries. It was all brought to a common location. Now, let me see if I can explain why this principle is so important. I'm a pastor. I pastor a church. And I am on a set salary. Matter of fact, I never even see my paycheck. Karen gets the check, she pulls it out, she deposits it, and it's the same every, every month. I pastor a church with a little more than a thousand members in Sacramento. I've got associate pastors in the neighborhood that are pastors of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They may have a hundred members, they get the same salary. You might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound fair. It's really a good plan. You see, when pastors get paid according to how many people are in their congregation, there's a temptation for them to baptize people that may not be ready to be baptized, so their salary goes up. When pastors are paid based on the size of their congregation, they're all wanting to climb the corporate ladder to get a bigger church. And you know, there are some congregations where the pastors paid from the local congregation, they get $100,000 a year. And they've got the, uh, they get a new car every two years, and they get the uh, spending budget with suits and all this stuff, and, and they're trying to work their way up. That's not God's plan. I like God's plan. Because those in Northern California that believe this message pay their tithe and it goes to a common storehouse where it is evenly distributed to the pastors. They get the same salary and it's sent overseas to fund the mission work, the surplus. My congregation pays over a million dollars in tithe a year. You think that's supposed to go to me? We haven't thought about this very long, have we? No, no, I'm just teasing. I'm just, just teasing. Of course not. The surplus, we have a staff of five pastors in our church, but the surplus then goes to pay. Some pastors have churches that can't afford even one pastor. And missionaries around the world to spread the gospel. And if you love the Lord and you're thankful for salvation, you want to subsidize other people finding everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Another reason this is a good plan is when I stand before my congregation Sabbath morning and I preach, I preach the same message to the rich as I do to the poor. Some of my pastors and these, my friends of other churches have this other system where they're paid directly from their congregation. They're afraid to step on the toes of the rich members because they're afraid they're going to withdraw their offerings. And they say, I can't hurt their feelings because, you know, they give a lot and that's going to affect my income. That's a bad system. The Bible wants us to be faithful to preach no matter whether they're rich or poor. We need to be faithful. And typically the Bible tells us it's the rich who've got most of the sin anyway. They need to hear it, right? The Bible tells us it's hard for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. And all of you want to be rich. Right? The Bible tells us that it's not God's plan that we should all be blessed in that way because some of us can't handle it. 
Some of us have been blessed with a great deal of extremity because the Lord knows it keeps you on your knees. Now, I want to say things in there. And I want to keep perspective. God does want to open the windows of heaven. He does want to bless you. He wants to bless you. But he's not going to bless you until you have your priorities straight. You listening? A lot of people are not blessed because they're not ready for it. They cannot handle it. When you're prepared to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, he can bless you. When your priority, your first priority is God's kingdom and his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ and the work of God, his kingdom, then he can bless you. When Solomon prayed and God said, what do you want? Solomon didn't say, uh, I want a, a bank account with millions of dollars in it. What Solomon said was, your people, your kingdom, Lord. I want righteousness to know the difference between good and evil. Did the Lord bless him with great abundance? Yes, because his priority was right. When Abraham had God as the center of his life, God blessed him fiscally. He blessed him with material wealth. And so did he Isaac. And so did he Jacob. And so did he Job. And so did he David. There's a lot of people in the Bible that were blessed in that way. It's because they had their priorities right. And so when we have our priorities right, where God and his kingdom becomes the center of our lives, he then can trust us with more. But some of us have not been faithful with pennies. God's not going to give you dollars. Amen? He that is faithful in that which is least is also faithful in much. And some people say, well, I don't give much now because I'm so poor. Well, if you're not being faithful in that which is least, if you can't have faith when you have just a little bit, you can't have faith in much. So we need to prove our trust of God in the little things, and he can bless us with more. Question number eight. When we tithe, who really receives our money? Is it going to the pastor? Is it going to the church? The Bible says in Hebrews 7, 8, here men that die receive tithes, but there he, he being who? Christ receiveth them. Colossians 3, verse 2, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. You know, when we give, we're giving to God. Uh, I need both hands again. I've got to talk about something. There's been an attitude that I encounter frequently that is very toxic. People say, I'm not going to give my tithe and my offerings. First of all, it's not yours, it's his. Amen. Because the pastor did something to hurt my feelings. Or because the church decorating committee did not pick the color carpet that I recommended. Or you'd be surprised the excuses that people come up with for not giving to God's work. First of all, in most cases, when people cease to give, they find excuses as a cloak for their covetousness and their greed. God commands us to give in spite of the fact that the people in the church may have hurt your feelings. The pastor may have hurt your feelings. Some of you perhaps remember the story where Hannah was praying that God would give her a son. And Eli, the pastor, accused her of being drunk. Well, that would hurt my feelings. But you know what? She brought her greatest gift, her child, and still gave it to the church in spite of that abuse. Some people say, well, I'm not going to give to the church because I know they mismanaged the money. Where, was there corruption in the church when Hannah gave Samuel, her son, to the church? You read the story and they were stealing the offerings and they were, there was immorality in the congregation. What about when Jesus was in the temple and that widow went by who was preparing to drop her last two cents into the treasury, the offering box? What was the condition spiritually of the religious leaders in that church at that time? Jesus said that they were hypocrites. They were vipers. Those were the people who were going to be responsible for crucifying him. And when that widow approached the offering box to put in her last two mites, she didn't want anyone to see. Christ said, no, 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 no. Don't give it there. Give it to Judas. Give it to us. Is that what he said? No. Christ blessed her for giving, right? He didn't say support my special ministry because the organization's corrupt. Have you heard that argument before? Yes. You know, it's a law of life that wherever you have people, you're going to have problems. And the church is an organization that has people in it. And there are going to be pastors that hurt your feeling. There are going to be people in the organization who may spend too much money or mismanage funds. Would you have supported Jesus when he walked the earth 2,000 years ago? If you lived back then, would you have supported his ministry? Did he have a Judas in the organization? And you still would have supported him. You see, God promises to bless you based on your giving. It's not on what's going to happen with it later. He wants to know what is the attitude in your heart. God looks on the heart. You know, as I walk up and down the streets in Manhattan here, there's a lot of people who are asking for spare change. They're panhandling. 
I used to do that. So my heart goes out to them. I used to beg for money. I used to play the flute. I offered a service, I felt, and so it wasn't quite as bad. But uh, want a little tip? One of the best ways to panhandle is get a puppy. Someone's going to do this soon. And say, pardon me, sir, could you have some spare change? My puppy's hungry. I found people much preferred feeding the dog than feeding me. <laughs> but you all know that some of these are scams. I saw a man, you know, well, I won't get into that, but sometimes I give, sometimes I don't. I don't always know. Sometimes people will say, sir, can spare change? I've got to go feed my baby. And sometimes I'm moved and I give. I don't follow them home to see if they're going to feed the baby. They may not, they may, but I still get my blessing because God knows my heart and I want to try to do right. If they mismanage the money, they get cursed, I get blessed. That's up to them, right? And so don't stop giving to God's work because it says you're giving to the Lord when you give, all right? He wants our hearts and that's the purpose for the giving. Question number nine. In addition to my tithe, something goes beyond that. What, which belongs to God, what else does he ask of his people? It says, bring in offering unto the Lord and come into his courts. Furthermore, it says in Malachi 3.8, will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. That's something beyond tithes. Some people are robbing God not only by not returning their tithes, but they never give. Some people think when they pay their tithe, that's the same as an offering. Does God make a distinction between tithes and offerings? Yes. Then we should too. The purpose for the tithe, it goes into the storehouse and it supports the work of ministry and missions around the world. The offerings, on the other hand, they go to help pay the local expenses for the church, the light bill and, and some of the um, other expenses that just go along with having a church family. Uh, local outreach and projects, that all comes from offerings. Number 10. How much should I give as an offering? How much should we give as offerings? Does God dictate that or is it something that comes from our hearts? 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. The Lord wants us to give cheerfully from our heart. And you know something I've discovered, friends? You cannot outgive God. If you're faithful in returning to Him, he continues to fill your hand. There's a principle. As you have one hand open in receiving the blessings of God, if you then look for opportunities to share those blessings, God will continue to put more and more in this hand that you might be a channel of blessing to the world. The Lord is wanting to bless the world. He does it through people. And that's not just talking about physical blessings. You know, I find that the more that I share the gospel with others, the more the Lord reveals to me. The more I study and share what I've learned with others, the more new insights and revelations God gives to me. So as I constantly give, He constantly gives me fresh supply. And so whatever it is, whether it's knowledge or resources, as you receive and share, God can trust you with more. You know, one reason God wants us to give is because we by nature are selfish creatures. Man was originally made in the image of God, motivated by love. Sin corrupted our motives. We are naturally selfish creatures now. That's why all children have to be taught to love. A baby is one of the most selfish creatures in the world. They're cute, but all they think about is themselves. Amen? Amen. Middle of the night, they wake up and they start crying because they're hungry or they have a plumbing problem. And mom says, dear, can you please wait? I haven't had any sleep and we'll take care of this in the morning. The baby says, I didn't realize how tired you were, mom. I'll be quiet. Is that what they say? They don't care. All they think about is their needs. You need to teach them to love and teach them to give. Now, we've got a whole tribe of kids in our family. And I've learned that instead of distributing things and dividing things among the kids, sometimes it's helpful to give the cookies to one child and say, now share with your brother. Or you give one big cookie and you say to Stephen, break it in half and then let your brother pick the piece he wants. Yeah, they're very careful then in dividing it in half. <laughs> they want to make sure it's exactly even. But you've got to teach them to share because it doesn't come naturally. They are all very grasping creatures. And you know, some of us have never outgrown that attitude of wanting to grasp and claw as much as we can. Question number 11. What test did Adam and Eve fail that we must pass if we expect to inherit God's kingdom? Answer. 
but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God had said you shall not eat of it neither shall you touch it lest you die furthermore the Lord says the silver is mine and the gold is mine says the Lord of hosts we are not to take what belongs to God it's called stealing and that leads us into the next question number 12 what commandment are we breaking when we refuse to return tithes and offerings to God what commandment will a man rob God yet you've robbed me you know some people do a lot of business under the table and they think they can hide it from the IRS and hide it from the world you can't do anything under the table and hide it from God can you furthermore it says but you say wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings and a lot of people are going to be shocked to discover in the judgment that they were very stingy and selfish in the resources and blessings God gave them some people will find out that the reason they were constantly struggling and in debt is because they neglected this simple principle of prosperity you need to learn to give give and it will be given unto you good measure shake down pressed together running over will men heap into your bosom for with what measure you meet it will be measured to you again once we learn this principle of giving God can give us when we fail to return our tithes and offerings the Bible says we are stealing and we know that's against one of God's commandments thou shalt not steal number 13 what does God say will happen to those who knowingly rob him of tithes and offerings answer Malachi 3 9 you are cursed with a curse for you've robbed me even this whole nation some people wonder why they can never get ahead and they just everything's breaking down and they're always in distress and I don't know what the reason may be but often I think it's because they're neglecting this very important principle of benevolence faithfulness in giving to God tithes and offerings you know I think it's interesting uh, a lot of these pastors who when you present the Sabbath truth they say that's the Old Testament that's the Old Covenant we're just New Testament now when it comes to tithes and offerings they have no problem with the Old Testament <laughs> have you noticed that you listen to their sermons and whoop, just like radar they're always going to all these great stories in the Old Testament they say yes it's still intact tithes and offerings they go all the way back to Abraham when it's tithes and offerings Sabbath they say no it's Old Testament we don't want that doesn't make sense to me friends there's a curse pronounced furthermore the Bible tells us in 1st Corinthians 6:10, nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God the Bible says that thieves will not be there and some people are thieves because they rob God every month every week and we need to learn to be faithful in this respect and he'll bless you now my own testimony is that when I first learned this principle like Jacob everything I owned I could fit in my backpack I accepted it and I began to pay tithe faithfully from my meager income some of you heard my testimony you know my dad's a billionaire but I left home and he basically wrote me off for years we didn't talk and I dug in the dumpster I panhandled when I gave my heart to the Lord I did everything from pick oranges to uh, I worked at Baskin Robbins and all the ice cream you could eat they told me you'll get tired of it eventually I never did <laughs> and um, I mean I did all kinds of different things but for years I sold firewood I did mechanic work and I sold firewood and I'll tell you what back then you work all day long you cut up and split and deliver a quart of wood and uh, by the time you pay for your truck gas and your chainsaw oil and gas and then you've got to take six dollars and fifty cents off the top sixty five dollars a quart back then that really took a big bite out of the income plus offerings beyond that but you know I said Lord I'm your problem my finances are your problem I'm gonna do what you tell me to do and I'm gonna leave the results to you friends I don't know when exactly it happened but little by little the Lord just kept on blessing and blessing until now God has blessed us so much that uh, we don't have a place to put all our stuff you've heard about opening the windows of heaven so you'll not have room enough to receive it we don't have room enough that's our problem in the bachelor family we've got our houses and garages closets crammed with the blessings of God we do we got too much stuff we need to have a garage sale <laughs> we could have one all by ourselves we could open a thrift store in my opinion in any event especially her closet no. 
That's not true. I'm sorry, dear. I'm just teasing. Boy, am I going to catch it later. Number 14. Why is covetousness so dangerous? It's a very dangerous thing. Why? The Bible tells us that some people make it a God. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. A lot of people, their treasure is here on earth. They make a God out of their money. Now, does the Bible say money is the root of all evil? No, but the love of money. And some people deify money. And some of you say, oh, Doug, I don't love money, but you like what it's going to buy. A lot of us worship our material possessions. And we spend all of our time insuring and storing and, and guarding and alarming our stuff. We've got to protect our stuff. And we'd say, I'd go work for Jesus overseas, but who's going to watch my stuff while I'm gone? You know, I've got all these things. And people measure their value based on how much stuff they've got. We say a person's successful based on their stuff, you know. And here in this world, we look at the car the man drives to prove he's a success, right? God looks at the man that drives the car. We look at the kind of house the family lives in. God looks at what kind of family lives in the house. In our world, we say, look at the dress the woman's wearing. God wants to know what kind of woman is wearing the dress. Am I right? We have everything backwards. Some people marry for money. They say, oh, it's love. You know, and you see these 20-year-old girls marrying these 95-year-old millionaires. They say, I love them. It's his winning disposition and good looks that attract me so much. <laughs> Reminds me of the story of this old millionaire married a pretty young thing, and he began to be insecure that she married him just for his money. He said, dear, if I lost all my money, would you still love me? She said, honey, of course I'd love you. I'd miss you, but I'd love you. <laughs> How do you suppose Jesus feels when we rob him in tithes and offerings. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 3 verse 10, wherefore I was grieved with that generation. And I said they always do err in their hearts. Now why is the Lord grieved when we're unfaithful in giving? Because one of the principal themes of the Bible is God so loved the world, He gave. God gave His greatest gift when He gave Jesus. And when we are reluctant to even give of our meager resources, we start measuring our worth by what we have. Christ has warned us that's a very dangerous attitude. Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. People load themselves down with so much stuff that they haven't got time for God. They're afraid to leave their house. I've met people who said, I can't go to church because I'm afraid someone's going to break in and steal my stuff. I've met people who are actually prisoners of their house to guard their stuff. They can't go out because they're watching their stuff. You know, I've a, I'm a pastor. I've done a lot of funerals. I've never yet seen a U-Haul being towed behind a hearse. You can't take it with you. Number 16. What other Bible principles does God share in regard to giving? There's several things we're going to look at quickly here. Answer A. First, they gave their own selves to the Lord. You remember when Zacchaeus was converted, after God got his heart, he then began to give his resources. He said, half my goods I give to the poor. If I've taken anything from any man by extortion, I'm going to pay him back fourfold. So when God has your heart, he has your means. Amen? Second point, answer B. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thy increase. Now, when Karen and I pay our tithe, we don't pay all our bills and say, I wonder if we have anything left over to pay tithe and offering. What should be first? Tithe ought to be first. Reminds me of this man who was constantly in debt and bill collectors were always after him. The bill collector called one day and he said, look, I've been calling and calling and you're ignoring me and I want you to pay your bills. And he said, listen, let me tell you something, buddy. He says, once a month, he says, I take all the bills and I put them in the hat and I pull out three and I pay them. He says, if you keep hounding me, I'm not even putting your bill in the hat anymore. <laughs> Some of us treat the Lord that way. We put him on the back burner. We say, I wonder if I got anything left to give God. Aren't you thankful the Lord did not give us the leftovers when he sent Jesus? He gave us his first fruits, and that's how we're to do it. And God will bless the other 90% if you give the first 10% unto the Lord. Amen? There is that scattereth and yet increaseth, 
And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tends to poverty. You know, in the farming community, they understood. If you ate all of your seed, you had nothing yet left for next year's crop. You had to maintain some of it to cast away. The Bible says, cast your bread on the waters, and after many days it will return unto you. He that considers the poor when he's in distress, the Lord will hear him. All through the Bible you see this principle that you must need to learn to give, to trust God. Now, do we only give when we've got an abundance? Or has the Lord promised to bless us when we give faithfully, sacrificially, when it might require us to even experience some loss? When Jesus commended that widow for giving her last two mites, she wasn't giving of her abundance. A lot of people make a big stink when they give something because they've got billions of dollars in the bank. You know, Bill Gates, you know, made the headlines and gave a billion dollars to this trust fund. And, oh, you got 43 billion. How can you spend one billion? People say, wow, he gave a billion dollars. But God looks at the percentages. There are some poor widows who are giving more than Bill Gates. Because they are sacrificing to give. When Bill Gates gives a billion dollars, he goes home to his mansion. He sleeps in the same bed. He eats the same food. You know what I'm saying? There's no sacrifice. He does not experience any loss to give that way. A lot of us, when we give, we give of our surplus. Because we say, I don't want to inconvenience myself. That's not sacrificial giving. Sacrificial giving means you must deny yourself something to give to the Lord. Okay? It goes on to say, answer, where am I? See. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth... Now, some of you don't want to be made fat, do you? It's talking about being, uh, having an abundance there. And he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Answer D. It is more blessed to give than receive. How many of you want to be blessed? A lot of us think, I want to be blessed, so I'm going to give, so I can receive. Now, who are you thinking about? Jesus said, give expecting nothing in return. You will be blessed. You'll get something in, turn, in return. But don't give so you can get. Don't pay your tithe and say, okay, I'll wait. Where's my windows of heaven? <laughs> That's not the right attitude, right? The first thing God wants to pour on you, first of all, is spiritual blessings. That's what you ought to ask for because the other stuff's not going to heaven. Answer E. He that layeth up treasure for himself but is not rich towards God. The Lord talks about that fool. The Lord blessed him. He said, oh good, I've got more. Ah, what shall I do? I'll build bigger barns and I can cram all my resources into these barns and I'll say to my soul, eat, drink and be merry. You've got stuff laid up for many days. I'm prepared for Y2K now. And the Lord said, you fool. Tonight your soul is required of you. Then who shall take advantage of those things you've laid up for? And then Jesus goes on to say, So shall it be for those who are rich towards themselves, but neglect God and others. What is the priority for the Christian? First, love the Lord. Then, love your neighbor as yourself. That ought to be your priority when you think about giving. Giving to God's work. Giving to your fellow man. And then God will give to you. You know, I like what John Wesley said. You're saying, Doug, are you saying we're supposed to give everything we have away to the Lord? No. You need to be led by the Spirit when it comes to offerings. We already know what tithe is. But there's a principle, and I don't know how to explain it except to say, Wesley put it this way, a Christian ought to earn as much as he can, give as much as he can, and save as much as he can. Now, you figure that out however you can, but there needs to be balance in the Christian life. Amen. Pay your tithe, give your offerings, earn as much as you can. Christians shouldn't squander the resources. We ought to try to earn and be productive. And at the same time, give as much as you can. And God will continue to bless you with more if you live by those principles. Furthermore, answer F. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will men heap into your bosom. With what measure you meet, it will be measured to you. Answer G. Let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. I told you that some of us are able to do so much more. I remember the first time my dad ever heard me preach. I kept wanting my dad to preach. You know, I've been preaching to thousands of people. I was down in Key Largo. My brother had a summer camp for children with cystic fibrosis, and I was a camp pastor. My dad came to visit. He's on his way home. I said, Dad, you know, I'm going to preach today at the Key Largo Seventh-day Adventist Church. He said, well, I think I'll come and hear you preach. And I've always wanted my dad to hear me preach. 
It's the smallest Seventh-day Adventist church in the world. I don't know if that's true. Sorry, friends in Key Largo, if you're watching right now. That day, there were seven people there. <laughs> my father pulls up in his Rolls Royce. My brother said, yeah, I'll come. He brings his wife. I'm there with the whole litter of kids. My cousin comes. There were more bachelors in that church that day than there were members. <laughs> then the deacon, who's also the elder and everything else in the church, he passes the plate during the offering while his wife plays the piano. My dad drops a hundred dollar bill in. He opens his wallet. This is full of hundred dollar bills. You know, he drops one in. And they almost fainted. <laughs> but for my dad, though that was a very generous thing to give, he, w he could have dropped everything in his wallet in and it would have been nothing for him. See what I'm saying? So we're to give as God has prospered us. Give in proportion to our ability. It's a whole principle of giving as you are able. Next answer, H. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he has given thee. And God will guide you with the Spirit in that respect. You know, a few years ago, 1998, October 27, there was a beautiful boat, originally owned by Onassis, Aristotle Onassis, a yacht called the Phantom. 280 feet long, four-mast schooner owned by Windjammer Barefoot Cruises Incorporated. And they took people around the Caribbean and different parts of the world on these luxury cruises. Hurricane Hugo was going through the Gulf on its way to Honduras. Very expensive ship. The owner said, drop off the passengers, but don't leave the boat there in the coast. There's a chance you can outrun the hurricane. Well, you don't want to have a great big iron hull vessel like this in a storm. But the owner said, it's such an expensive boat, we'd hate to lose it, though we realize there's a risk that uh, the crew might be in danger. The boat is such an expensive boat. So they dropped off the passengers, and 31 crew did their best to outrun a hurricane. The hurricane turned and chased them down. The last time the captain called in, he said, we've got 40-foot waves and 115-mile-an-hour winds. I don't know how much longer we can hang on. They never heard from the ship again. They never have located it. Not one of the crew was ever found again. The families of the crew, very low paid people who came from some of these third world countries are suing because they said, you put the value of the boat ahead of human life. You know how often that happens every day? People step on each other on their way to success. You know, if you want to walk on golden streets, you can't walk on people here. We've got to have our priorities right. The most important thing in this life is human life. Number 17. What did the ladder that Jacob saw in his dream represent? That ladder represented Jesus that reached from earth to heaven. Christ is the bridge. John himself explained in verse 51. Hereafter, Christ said, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of God man. Christ is the Son of Man. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We cannot buy our way into heaven. When the Lord returns, the Bible tells us in Revelation that the rich men will say to the rats and the bats and the moles, I'd like to make a deposit. They will be casting their gold to the doleful creatures and to the caves. It will be worthless. Nothing in this world is going to heaven except what we convert into the resources of God's currency in saving souls. I pray that that is your desire. Please listen. As John sings, and I have a special story I want to share at the conclusion of this song. I'd rather have Jesus than see And 
like to go to the next question. What is the greatest gift that we can give to Jesus? What does the Lord say in Proverbs 23 verse 26? My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Mark 7 verse 6. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Reminds me of the story. I was driving one day on my way to a hospital, make some visits, and I saw this terrible accident had taken place. A U-Haul had run into a logging truck head on, and the U-Haul just exploded, and these people had been moving and their possessions were all over the road. I went to the hospital to visit, and I met the family that had been involved in this accident. The mother told me the story. She and her husband and her daughter had been moving from the north to the south, hundreds of miles. Everything they owned was in the U-Haul. Father and daughter were driving together in the U-Haul truck. The mother was ahead in the pickup truck. She looked in the rearview mirror and suddenly noticed they were not beside her or behind her. They had hit a head-on, had a head-on collision with a logging truck. All their possessions were scattered all over the highway. She said she turned around and went back was horrified. Her son, husband was laying in the road, bleeding to death. Her daughter was, I think, unconscious in the cab of the truck. Their possessions were everywhere. She held on to her husband, waiting for the emergency vehicles to come. And the people going by were stopping their cars and taking their possessions and putting them in their cars, having a free-for-all. She said she could not believe the covetousness, the greed in the human heart that here, he was dying, and they were picking up their things and hauling them off. She said, we lost everything in one day, like Job. So we lost our health, lost our home. When we moved, we lost our friends, lost our possessions. She said, I'm so thankful that I'm a Christian and that we have God. Amen. Driver of the logging truck died. The husband did survive. The daughter did survive. But she said, we lost everything in one day. God can give it to you all in one day. He can take it all away in one day. Do not set your heart upon the things that are here. They're transitory. Someday, friends, you and I are going to need to learn to do what Lot did, to turn our back on everything and head for the hills. If we do not learn the lesson of Lot's wife, if we're turning back longing for the things that the world affords, we're going to perish. It's my appeal for you to remember, covetousness is a very dangerous thing. The Bible tells us that it was greed that nailed Jesus to the cross. That's right. Love of money is what crucified our Lord. And there are many today who would be willing to sell out on Jesus for earthly possessions. It's a very dangerous attitude. You know, it's one thing to say, I love you, Lord. It's like that bumper sticker I saw. If you love Jesus, honk. Everybody says, if you love Jesus, honk. 
It's easy to honk your horn. Then one day after that, I saw a bumper sticker. It said, if you love Jesus, tithe. Anybody can honk. If you love Jesus, you give him your time. Time is the stuff that life is made of. That's what the Sabbath is all about. You give him your holy time. If you love Jesus, you tithe. And you return your offerings to him. Friends, I know some of you are hearing these things for the first time. I want you to give God a chance to bless you. You know, as a pastor, my heart is grieved when I consider the percentage of our people that are in financial bondage. You know, I think in the last days, one of the things the devil is going to do is people are going to be held in financial bondage. And the devil is going to capitalize on that when he makes these laws where people cannot buy or sell. They're going to say, I can't flee. I'm in debt. I'm obligated. I can't get on my own. You know, one of the most important secrets that begins a journey to financial freedom. I'm not telling you that God's going to make you a millionaire. I don't believe in that prosperity preaching. But I do believe the Lord wants you to be debt free. I think as far as possible, you ought to avoid debt like a plague. Amen? Karen and I, we have credit cards, but as soon as we get the bill, we pay them off. If we don't have the money, we don't buy it. It's a principle. That, otherwise, you're buying on faith that someday you're going to get the money. That's a very dangerous thing for Christians to do. You know, Jesus tells us that he wants us to go around the world preaching. When he sent the disciples out, they were free to preach. He said, don't weigh yourself down with extra shoes and extra purse. He said, you go. And a lot of God's people are not able to go with the message because we are so imprisoned with our possessions. We're so in bondage with debt. We've got to learn these principles of how to be able to serve the Lord. What we own ought to be paid for, and we ought to be faithful in giving God's tithes and His offerings unto Him. Do you believe that, friends? If it's your desire, by God's grace, to remember that all that you are and all that you have belongs to Him, then would you please stand with me as we close this Sabbath service with prayer? Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the blessings that Jesus gives us. We're so thankful, Lord, for the sacrifice you made when you gave your son because you love the world so much. Lord, we want to show our love for you by giving as well. Take our hearts. We know if you have our hearts, you'll have everything else. You'll have our closets and our refrigerators and our wallets and everything if you have our hearts. Lord, take our hearts. Take our minds. You deserve it. You died to redeem us. We thank you for the promise that if we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, you'll take care of the other needs. We're asking in Christ's name.